all very interesting. Now, Rebecca Long Bailey is the left's chosen candidate to be Labour's next leader. Her campaign is confident she can overtake the current frontrunner, Sir Keir Starmer, and therefore one day become our Prime Minister. And she is my final guest this morning. Uh, welcome, Rebecca Long Bailey. Good morning, Andrew. Now, I know you don't like being described as the continuity Corbyn candidate. But uh, Jeremy Corbyn, can I remember, only last month at a meeting said this. It's an absolute pleasure to be here alongside Becky Long Bailey, our candidate for leader. Was that unhelpful? Not unhelpful. I mean, Jeremy and myself are friends, but it's quite disrespectful sometimes when I'm termed the continuity candidate. I've always been strong to my principles. Everybody knows what I believe in and I'll never deviate from that. But I'm very much my own person and to mm. suggest I'm a continuation of any individual is quite disrespectful, disrespectful well, not least because I'm a woman, quite frankly. It may not be about, about gender, but about politics, because up by our candidate, did he not mean that you were the candidate of the Socialist Campaign Group, which includes well, I, well, I Jeremy am. Corbyn, John MacDonald, Diane Abbott and you and Richard Bergen? I am the candidate of the Socialist Campaign Group, but I'm also the candidate of various trade unions and indeed a number of constituency parties who've mm. nominated me, and I thank them all for their support. And who's chairing your campaign? I've got John Trickett as my MP, who's chairing the campaign. He's a fantastic campaigner and coordinator. And John Lansman? And John Lansman is the campaign so, director organising the, the logistics in the background. Who is the man, let's remind ourselves, who formed Momentum, which was formed to back Jeremy Corbyn? So there is a pattern emerging here. And you're also very strongly backed by Len McCluskey, who is also one of Jeremy Corbyn's strongest backers. So this is not about men or women, but your politics quite clearly portray you as the continuity Corbyn candidate. Well, my politics, Corbynism well, candidate, my politics and my ability and the ideas that I've certainly developed over the last five years, it's not about putting us into particular camps. I think they've supported me because they've seen that I'm the candidate with the big ideas and they know that the vision that I have will transform society and raise up the aspiration of our communities. Recently, let's turn to your own words, you've said, um, I don't just agree with the policies, I've spent the last four years writing them. And you've also said, I've learned so much from Jeremy, John and Diane. We must not retreat from that politics. You are absolutely in the same tradition as Jeremy Corbyn's politics. Well, we've got to recognise where we were five years ago as a party. And we've come so far and we developed some of the most transformational policies that we've seen in a generation. The Green Industrial Revolution that I worked on was one of them. But we've also got to understand the reasons as to why we didn't lose, we didn't win this general election. It was the most devastating defeat we've ever seen. And we got things wrong. Our message on Brexit, we lost the trust of many of our communities. Our Leave voters thought we were trying to overturn the result of the referendum. Many of our Remain voters thought we weren't going far enough to forge a strong relationship with the EU. We lost trust on a whole range of other issues, anti-Semitism, divisions within the mm. party. And in terms of the manifesto itself, despite having some great policies, we didn't have a message that drew them all together around aspiration and bettering people's lives. And often the campaign was quite chaotic in the way that policies were thrown out to left, right and centre. So it's all about the selling. You think you had exactly the right policies and the right number of policies and you would do it all again, you just sell it a bit better. It's not to say that there aren't different ways of doing this. So one example I'll give is that you have a manifesto set of policies that are deliverable within five years. And then you also have things that are part of a longer term programme. So, for example, the four day working week, that was never going to be delivered in five years. That was a long term aspiration. And it only, been in there. it only would have happened after we'd improved productivity by investing mm. in our economy through an industrial strategy. It only would have happened when we'd strengthened the role of trade unions in workplaces so that collective sectoral bargaining could have taken place. But unfortunately, the message that went out in that election campaign is that we were suddenly going to click our fingers and everyone would be on a four day week. And that was preposterous and it was quite damaging. Mm. So differentiating between what is in a manifesto that's deliverable in the short term and what's part of our longer term programme, I think is very important. I've spoken to quite a few senior Labour Party people on air since the election defeat. And I've asked each one of them, do you take personal responsibility for the defeat? And given that you wrote those policies, I ask the same question to you. I do, and certainly I was very upset that we didn't sell many of the policies in the way that I would have hoped. So Green Industrial Revolution is a key example. This was a policy that would have tackled climate change, but it also would have invested in our economy, re-industrialised many parts of the so-called Red Wall and provided jobs, security, a quality of life for the future. 
But that message wasn't delivered on the doorsteps, unfortunately, yeah. through the campaign itself. It seems as if a lot of potential Labour voters simply looked at the amount of money that you were going to borrow and raise and spend and thought, it's too much, it's impossible. So can I ask you, in that context, are you still committed to spending more than £98 billion extra a year by 2024? I think, oh, well, according to our grey book, and I can't remember all the figures now... Uh, this is the IFS's analysis of your policy. in my head, when it was £82.9 that we were planning to spend, public spend, and it's important to differentiate that from capital and investment. And you stick by that? I do, because we weren't being radical in terms of our public spending plans. In fact, we were way behind other leading industrial nations on this. And you've got to remember what the whole point of public services are. They are the foundations of an aspirational society good education, good healthcare system, good public services, underpinning every single person okay. within our communities and enhancing their ability to do well in life. And that's critical. So she would never be ashamed of public spending right. and investing okay. in our public services. Go going forward, we are now out, out of the EU. That's done. Yeah. Are, are, does Labour under Rebecca Long-Bailey become a return to the EU party or do you accept that argument is now No, over? I think it will be absolutely disastrous to go into the next general election advocating a position of rejoining the EU. We've seen the damage that our compromise position mm. did in this election campaign and whilst we were trying to bring together divided communities, we weren't trusted failed, yes. and it was, it was not a good position to be in. So our role now is to over the next four years, set out a positive vision of what Great Britain looks like outside of the European Union. We can't retreat to a position where we're waiting four years to tell our voters that they got it wrong. We've got to understand why many people wanted to leave the European Union and make that vision positive. In the same context, I asked Angela Rayner about free movement, extending free movement, which your party has voted for. Do you believe in extending free movement rights? My own personal view on this, Andrew, is I am in favour of free movement, but We've got to be pragmatic and realise the position that because we're in. Because a lot of your voters are not, or potential Labour voters, left the Labour Party, giving you the worst, I think, election defeat since 1935 and went to the Conservatives on precisely this issue. Well, what I'm wondering, have you changed your mind at all Well, that's on this? right, but whether, whatever we believe on freedom of movement, we're not in government. We have got a Conservative government with a huge majority. And our role now as an opposition is to make sure that when the government formulates its new immigration system... It's based on fairness, it's based on values, not targets. It ends the hostile environment. It ends the no recourse to public funds. It extends voting rights for all migrants who come to this country. And it's about instilling a system of fairness. Now, you signed up this week to a series of pledges from the Labour Campaign for Trans Rights. One of them says that you should accept that there is no material conflict between trans rights and women's rights. So does that mean that if a, Labour, a woman in the Labour Party wants to debate the rights of trans women to enter spaces like women's refuges, that conversation now cannot take place? We can all have legitimate and uh, comradely debate within the party, and I'd encourage that. But in terms of the position of trans rights, I've been very clear on this. I support the right to self-ID, and we've got to recognise the amount of transphobic hate that there is out there both within certain elements of the media and coming from our communities, right. the difficulties that trans people face. And as a party, you would expect us to be at the vanguard of tackling that transphobic uh, behaviour. Uh, the pledge that you have also signed says that it's important to organise and fight against transphobic organisations such as Women's Place UK, LGB Alliance and other trans-exclusionist hate groups. So to be clear, you would regard Women's Place UK as a hate group? I'm not regarding any particular group as a hate group. But what, signed, I, would say, what, I, what I would say very clearly is that there is no place within the Labour Party for transphobic behaviour in the same way that there should be no place in the Labour Party for any form of discriminatory or racist or anti-Semitic behaviour. I've been a strong advocate of an independent disciplinary process and any member, whatever group they're from, if they display those kind of behaviours, they shouldn't be in the party. So you would regard Women's Place UK as a transphobic hate group. If you become leader, do you start to throw people out of the party? No, I've not. I've not. No, one? let me be clear. I've not, I've not referred to any specific organisation as a hate group. But what I would say... I'm sorry, the pledge what I would say, does say what, that specifically. Andrew, what I would say is that any member of our party who goes through our disciplinary process, which will be a new process under myself, an independent one, if they're found guilty of being transphobic, then they shouldn't be within our party. It's as simple as that. 
So, well, let me give you the example of Jess Phillips, for instance, former leadership candidate herself, who retweeted Women's Place UK and says she could find that its demands completely reasonable. Jess Phillips could be kicked out of the Labour Party if Rebecca Long-Bailey becomes leader. No, well, unless Jess Phillips has said anything transphobic, and I don't understand that she has, but there's no conflict. No, let me be clear, there's no conflict between the rights of women and the protection of women and safety in particular places and trans rights. And we need to stop having this debate within the party on that basis. It's right to stand up for women's rights. It's right to stand up for the rights of trans people. There doesn't need to be a differentiation but between the two. You have signed a pledge, which you must have read before you signed it, which says that people, organisations such as uh, uh, Women's Place UK People who support that should be kicked out of the Labour Party. You've signed that I pledge. don't think it says that. I think Not it says it. that anybody that's found guilty of transphobic behaviour should be kicked out of the Labour Party. And that's my firm position in the same way that any member found guilty of discriminatory behaviour or racist, anti-Semitic, or or Islamophobic. They shouldn't be in the party. Well, you've said that. So if, if those are organised, if those are hate groups, then they should be kicked out of the Labour Party. And what I'm saying to you is an awful lot of as it were, good feminists inside the Labour Party would be caught by this. I'm going to quote somebody else, Karen Ingela Smith, who is a Labour Party member who runs a charity combating uh, violence against women and women's refugees. She's worked on this for a very, very long time. And here is what she says, forgive me, it goes on a bit. Women experiencing trauma after violence and abuse will, like most of us, almost always instantly read someone who might be the most kind and gentle trans-identified male in the world as male and they may experience debilitating terror immediately and involuntarily. I've lost count of the number of victim survivors of men's violence who've told me how important a women-only service was to them. They are often upset and emotional when they start to talk about this. Now, does somebody who thinks that stay a member of the Labour Party or not? I think it's right to understand and listen to the concerns of women, particularly those who've suffered from domestic abuse. And we don't have public services that are capable of mm. dealing with those issues at the moment due to the vast range of cuts that this government has brought into place. But we can't use that as an argument to discriminate against trans people. And that's my point, is that if people are saying transphobic things, they shouldn't be in the Labour do you, Party. Do you think that was but it is right. No, it's right to talk about the safety of women. No one would discriminate anybody in our party for doing that, but it's not at the expense of trans rights. So coming a little bit closer to home, Laura Pidcock, a friend of yours, former Labour MP, says, I think there has to be the enforcement of single space exemptions for women to heal and recover. And it's absolutely crucial that there are spaces, that there is provision for trans people to also get the help and support. Is that the kind of view that is welcome inside the Labour Party? I think Party? women and trans people all need support. And I think we'd meet in agreement on that point. Now, all of this, I mean, the, the, the law over, overall arching this is the Equality Act of 2010, which yeah. is therefore, of course, a Labour Act. And that says that trans people uh, even if they have got identifying documents, um, can be excluded from certain women-only spaces. Given what you've said, would you change that law? I do, and I want a right to self-ID for trans people. It's not an easy journey to go on as a trans person to determine changing your, your sex, if you like. And we know the, the mental health issues that many within our trans community face. They've got extremely high suicide rates, and we should never underestimate the pain that those individuals mm. go through, and that's why So you why would change it's right. that law? I want the right to self-ID, and I want that enshrined in law. All right, let's, let's talk about another big issue. You have stood up to anti-Semitism in the party, you yeah. say, yes? Do you recognise this sentence? It should not be regarded as anti-Semitic to describe Israel, its policies, or the circumstances surrounding its foundation as racist. I think under the International Holocaust yeah. Remembrance definition, it would be anti-Semitic to regard Israel as a racist endeavour. So you, so you regard that sentence as anti-Semitic? You've said that. I don't think it's racist to stand up for the, the right, or anti-Semitic, should I say, or racist either or, to stand up for the right of Israel to exist, and that's something that I very much support, but I also support a two-state solution uh, right. and don't condone the actions of the Israeli government in terms of illegal settlements, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it's that so was, important... That was a sentence you in the past have said was anti-Semitic. There was a National Executive Committee meeting in October 2018 where Jeremy Corbyn arrived and read out that statement as a proposed addition to the Labour Party policy. You must have been horrified when that happened. I think under the IRA definitions, it's very important to make it clear that supporting the right of Israel to exist and not kind of examining in any great detail the history is, is not... 
it, it's incompatible with with a definition of anti-Semitism, quite frankly. And we need to be very careful so, on that. But that doesn't when, that when doesn't you, discriminate heard, I'm against. I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you heard that statement made by Jeremy Corbyn, which you have described as anti-Semitic, did you speak out against it? At I don't. The time? Well, I don't remember the incident itself. It was mentioned to me at a meeting the other night, and I don't I don't you, recall you were it. You at that honest. meeting. Well, I don't recall that statement being made. But I'm very clear on us not questioning the right of Israel to exist, and certainly not saying that in any way so, it's a racist endeavour. I'm clear on this, that, Andrew. This, this happens at the moment when the anti-Semitism row is at its height in the Labour Party. You're at an NEC meeting, your leader arrives and reads out a statement which you regard as anti-Semitic, and you can't remember that. And Well, I'm being clear on what my view on this is, Andrew. I do not think that it's right to call Israel or the creation of Israel a racist endeavour. I think right. that that's anti-Semitic. And we've got to recognise where we are on anti-Semitism within the party. Okay. We have not taken enough action. It's not been robust enough. And as Labour leader, right. I would adopt any recommendations made by the EHRC. I would adopt the 10 pledges right. made by the Board of Deputy. And I would restore trust with the Jewish community. Rebecca Long-Bailey, thanks Thank very much you. indeed for talking to us today. Thank